All right. I am sitting here in beautiful San Diego, California with Brad Souza, the CTO of ABI Systems. We want to thank our sponsors, Bose Professional and ABI Systems yeah, for yeah, hosting yeah. today's session. And we are talking about trends, transformations, changes that are occurring in the education sector. And now I want to dig in on this topic of the evolving college experience. Right. We've talked a lot about outcomes and experiences today. And, um, you described, uh, as I think I did as well, my college experience, right. our college experience, right. to today's college experience. What are the things that have got you the most excited with how that experience has changed? We've talked about pedagogy in the classroom. Right. We've talked about venues and how large venues are changing in terms of public and private partnerships. What are some other areas that have got you fired up in terms of the college experience evolving. Yeah, so it's really interesting to me that that the college experience back in my day, I'll say, was really the professor transferring to the student, uh, with the professor being the center of all wisdom and knowledge, and, and the student kind of absorbing it and trying to figure out what to do with it, right? And today, the college experience really seems to be much, much more student-centric. And part of that is just the evolution of technology that uh, yeah. I can, everything I want to know, I can get to through something that's in my hand. Right. Um, and that's transitioned not only into how instruction is, happen is being delivered, but I think it's transitioned into the whole experience. Right. right. The dorm rooms in the past, I might have a TV on the wall and yeah. I might be flipping through channels. But today, when we're talking about designing for student housing, there's actually no television. Right. Right. It's it's yeah. all around my personal devices and laptops, laptops tablets, tablets, mobile phones, devices. Yeah, whatever it is. Yeah. That is that's really serving it it's a it's a different way of consuming learning and consuming the, the college experience because it's very centric around me and my my personal preferences. I'm just thinking as you're talking, how many screens does the average student have access to during oh any gosh, given right? event? I mean, so you've got mobile phone. Right. You have maybe a display in the classroom. Right. At you, least one. At least one. Right. Um, you may have laptop and or tablet. Right. You know, so we're going three and four devices. Right. Whereas not too long ago, we might have only had one device. Right. Validating fact checking. A uh, professor's commentary, for example, is a whole new program, right? right? And it, it, I think it, it <laughs> right. creates immediacy in the classroom or it creates immediacy even in, you know, the interactions with students. So what are some of the challenges um, and opportunities that that presents? So when you have information flowing so rapidly and at the same right. time, you're trying to sort of teach mastery in a topic, right. you know, how do you address that as a challenge and an opportunity for learning? Yeah. So if you take it from um, the user's perspective first, as opposed to, you know, how are you going to engineer and provide this? The, the user's expectation is that it's limitless, right? I should be able to get access to anything I want at any given time. And to some degree, that's that's kind of how we've trained, uh, you know, Gen Zers in general, is that it's all readily available. Right. So let's take that now. Let's move it into something that we're maybe uh, we think we're more familiar with, but I bet we're probably not as familiar with it as we would think. And that, that's the idea of athletic recruiting or even just student recruitment. So it, it's when, when we look at doing a uh, athletic facility, um, designing AV into an athletic facility, you might think of it in terms of, you know, front right. of house and a stadium or whatever. And that certainly is part of it. But the idea today of a student coming to a campus commitment, touring the school, and then after they've met everybody, they're walking down this hallway yeah. with video walls on both sides and this immersive experience playing their senior game films. <laughs> and at the end is this great place where all the seniors come together and applaud you as you sit on this throne or chair and you say, yeah, I'm ready to commit. Yeah. That creating a recruiting experience around that specific athlete. Yeah. That's a completely different perspective. Yeah. I want to, I want to go into two different yeah. uh, areas that you just hit there. So the recruiting experience is one. Um, 
I had an opportunity to go through the Breslin Center at Michigan State, right. my, one of my alma maters, right. uh, where I did my master's program. And what was fascinating about that experience is there is a hall. There is a large video right. wall. There is, uh, you know, these um, almost ritualistic aspects exactly. of the program. Exactly. You know, when you think about recruiting into the future, um, do you have any experiences or insight into how schools are thinking about doing recruiting differently, you know, even things we haven't maybe even thought about yet or things that are occurring that we just don't see. Yeah. So I, you know, I don't know that I necessarily have my thumb on the pulse of what it's going to look like. Right. As much as I see the, the utilization of tech as being very, very different. I mean, I saw as an example, mm -hmm. um, in the past, a football coach, especially a championship level BCS football coach, you know, you would recruit based upon their expertise and right. ability and, and their reputation and the win loss scores and all that kind of stuff. Right. You wouldn't think of them necessarily as a social media phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. Right. But now you see the, the head coach at, I don't know, maybe Alabama. Right. Who's on social media dancing with a recruit's mom in their living room. Right. And that's right. the extent of how yeah. I'm going to recruit. Yeah. And, and it's, it's all tied into social. And Digital experience. Exactly. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So you see the Instagram post, you're seeing the tweet um, of the experience. You know, these are the channels right. that are being leveraged and, and then the customization of the experience for the potential athlete or student. Right. So being able to put yourself into the seat, you know, your face on the jumbo truck. Exactly. You know, whatever. Right. right. And creating yeah. maybe some of these. Hear your name in the stadium. <laughs> t today, it's around right. playing game film. Right. Tomorrow, it might be around creating a virtual experience of right. you running out onto the field with your, you know, or you yeah. making that, you know, tomahawk dunk or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Going long if you're a baseball player, whatever it is, trying to create those virtual experiences. Uh, can you see yourself here and how yeah. awesome that will be? Yeah, right? yeah, really good point, really good point. And in terms of, um, I want to go to the other side of this, yeah. which is how much of this can be just a massive set of distractions? So I want to, you know, the college experience, we're talking about all these channels, all this information. Um, I, would, I would probably venture to guess that a lot of instructors, educators would say, I don't know when they're listening or when they're, Researching, it's right. like we we've got distraction going right. on. So, talk a little bit about distraction and you know how people might look at that. And then you know what about the other fatigue issues that you see that sort of arise out of an experience-driven educational opportunity? Yeah. So, so the distraction is really an interesting question, and, and and I would say I'll insert myself maybe into those experiences that. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I would find myself speaking someplace and uh, thinking, what's everybody doing? They're not engaged in what I'm saying. And, right. And then I'd walk off stage and there'd, you know, be 300 you know, <laughs> people social lined media up. Yeah. Well, social, social media, media requests. requests. Yeah. That's what they were doing. That's what they were doing. They were right. trying to link you. Yeah. yeah. Here, I thought they were distracted or right. watching some YouTube video, but yeah. maybe what, what they were doing was actually doing research on me and fact checking me. And then found an affinity and wanted Isn't to Isn't that an idea? Right. They're fact checking you while right. you're talking. Exactly. Right. Which is what's happening in the classroom today. Right. 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 Which puts a different onus yeah. on the teacher. The, the yeah. instructor's really around, you how do I apply it. this? That's right, you right. can't fake it. Yeah. And how do I apply this this thing we're learning? Right. Not, not specifically on the, on the element that I'm learning, but how do I apply it? Right. It's really changed. And so you're saying embrace it. I, I so am. So yeah. don't, don't, don't let it discourage you. You know, the, the distraction is actually, you know, more of an opportunity is the way you're looking at it. Yeah, I don't see yeah. it as a distraction. As a distraction at all. Right. Okay, wrong word. So, yeah. so in, in, the, in the context of does my, does my college university experience prepare me for work, that's how, how we work today. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we mm -hmm. don't we don't get into a, a conference room and somebody sits at the head of the table, generally speaking, and tells us, lectures us on what we want to have happen. Right. What we're doing is we're collaborating together and we're collaborating with each other in the room and we're collaborating with people who aren't in the room and we're collaborating with people that are at different locations. And, and it's not just 
kind of look at a document together, it's real time information exchange, co-authoring, seeing and talking to each other, reading the, the, the body language and the nonverbal cues to create consensus and, and move a decision forward. That's how we do it in work today. Mm -hmm. That's how the most productive work environments are operating today. That's, that's what's happening in the classroom or should be happening in the classroom. And uh, I don't see it as a distraction. I see that at, actually as adding velocity behind the learning experience. I, I think what you're describing to me is the possibility that you could come into a classroom environment and the answers aren't all known. It's the, right. it's the beauty of the experiment, you know, the scientific right. methodology, right. where we go down a path of learning together. Right. Um, whereas maybe there's been more of a focus of there's a right answer and a wrong answer. I'm going to teach you the right answers. Right. You know, versus a discovery process, right. which is really pointing to the experience. I love that. Yeah. And if you think about it from a generational perspective, that's what a, a Zer expects. Right. A Zer's natural tendency is going to be um, to crowdsource that problem, bring people together on some app that I'm most comfortable with that I happen to know that my friends are on. And as a result of that, start a conversation right away and listen to what their experiences are right. and then contribute that experiences to the group that I'm working with. That's the same kind of thing that we, that we think we see in terms of active learning. That's what we see right. in terms of the classroom experience. But now I extend that outside of the classroom across the entire campus. Yep. And from the campus extended it to the workplace, that now becomes the environment that learning is really happening in. Is there ever a situation where it's total overload? Oh like, my gosh, yes. Yeah, okay, so to the organization listening in today, where there's massive overload or there's not enough load, you know, what would you say are the characteristics of overload? And then what is the, hey, you haven't gone quite as far as you could, and you, you've right. got some ground to still cover. Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, with all learning, there, there's outcomes that we're measuring against. And I think that the outcomes that we're measuring isn't just the, the ability to retain and kind of respond with a set of knowledge. I think it's important to include in those outcomes um, how you got there and, and what contributed to it. Not, not just the sources of the information that you got, but who are the people that you use to find those sources and how did you collaborate and, and come to the conclusion that you came to that's integrated into the, into the measurement of the outcome that we're looking for, which is a very different way of looking at test scores and essays and all the kinds of things that, that we right. normally are used to thinking about in a university. I think on the converse, you can, you can be overload. And so I think it's incumbent upon the teacher, the professor, at that particular time to say, out of the universe of available resources, these are the things I would encourage you to consider first. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I would consider these resources the most credible resources. Continue to develop your own list of credible resources. Don't bring to me resources that are not credible and there's gonna be subject to scrutiny. Yeah, sure, right? right, right. So, but find credible resources. Here's the list of credible resources I would start with. And that would yeah. help kinda uh, help limit the amount of non-productive work and, and maybe the overload that we're talking about. Right, right. When um, you think about the design implications related to audiovisual approach and experience, what are some of the pitfalls or traps that uh, a lot of people fall into when they're going down the path of experience? Yeah. So, you know, you talk a lot about outcomes, mm -hmm. especially sure. mm -hmm. as being the most important aspect. And, and, and sometimes I think there's sort of the gitchy, uh, you know, flavor of the day kind yeah. of things that are yeah. exciting. Yeah. Um, we won't, you know, name the technologies per se, sure. but it's like it's really easy to index maybe to the right or to the left, yeah. a little too far. Yeah. So when you're thinking about making sure that you're, you sort of create a, a really rock solid approach, what, what would you be thinking? I mean, in terms of uh, giving advice to an organization to, to, to plan. Yeah, so I, I would say there's two um, maybe overriding philosophies I would encourage um, uh, people to think about is they're considering what that technology design might look like. The first is uh, as much as you can avoid silos. 
really look at technologies as integrated with each other and ecosystems. Because if you define it as a silo or a platform, now you're stuck with that. And when that platform can't deliver on what the user's expectation is, you end up defending why you have that platform as opposed to creating an ecosystem or moving away from it. Right, right. So try and avoid silos. Really look at technologies as deeply integrated together, even though they may not uh, at the surface um, can be necessarily integrated. Right. And think of it as an ecosystem. So that's one. And, and the other one is uh, really begin with um, what what's that experience and how do I quantify uh, the technology against the experience. It, maybe I need to be a little bit more specific and put it in the context of it's okay to look at shiny things. It's different. It's not okay to put those shiny things into production. Mm, mm-hmm. So so let's look at those shiny right, things. Right. Let's, let's experiment with them with smaller groups. Let's define as a result of those experiences that we have with those shiny things, whether they actually move forward the outcome that we're trying to accomplish. If we do, then let's integrate them into our production environment. Yeah. If they don't, Let's recognize it for what it is. It's a really cool, shiny thing. I really yeah. like it, yeah. but it's not quite ready to really add velocity to the outcome I'm trying to achieve. Yeah. When it does, then we'll integrate it into our production environment. And that idea around having a, a development development environment and a production environment is really very natural to the IT thought leader or to a software developer. It's foreign to an yeah. AV integrator Mm. Um, and so we would say experiment with it create pilots or proofs of concepts but don't integrate it into your recognize you do have a production environment don't integrate it into your production environment until you know it's it's almost like you're describing av devops you know where where it's like there's the there's the two pieces the benefit that comes comes from looking at it more broadly yeah Um, i gotta ask the question uh was facebook uh, a good example of an experience in a DevOp environment that uh, that 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 achieved some yeah, I think much it, broader. Yeah, I, I, I suppose the, the history tells us, yeah, right? Yeah, I but it was it a great example of uh, you know directory services on a ca- yeah. on a campus environment exactly that that, uh, that continued to, uh, to yeah. evolve. Right? It right. wasn't it wasn't so locked down to a they didn't they didn't love a protocol so much right that they were unwilling to move away from it yeah right so the result was that as the expectation of the user evolved and be, people began to experiment with it and say wow I can use it for this and now yeah. I can use it for that they weren't so in love with a with a protocol or a, a software stack that they couldn't continue to evolve along with so AV design should be looked at the same way absolutely it should yeah yeah. That's right. Right. So as as you are thinking about environments today, you know, maybe an institution or two today that's been going down this path. Yeah. Is there a example that you could maybe share of an organization that put in place that uh, that philosophy? Yeah, that's given it you know, maybe yielded for them some really great benefits. Yeah. So so it's interesting because a lot of the, the more tech facing schools, you know, they, they might seemingly naturally adopt this and they do. And, and that provides some great working environments. Um, uh, what we're finding though, is that the larger D one schools, their tension is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Um, their tension is how do I honor the legacy and history of a USC or a legacy or an history of a U of O or a, mm-hmm. um, a Michigan State or a mm-hmm. whoever it is. How do I honor the legacy and the traditions and the history there, but at the same time continue to progress the technology in a way that continues to make it very relevant? What we do here, very relevant, easy to consume, very s- student centric. Yeah, that's the mm-hmm. challenge that we're that we're seeing happening. Right. We've seen a few that have that are really pretty amazing. You yeah, know, we've seen some things that. Uh, at um, uh, Chapel Hill that have been really exciting to see. We've seen some things um, at uh, uh, Michigan Tech Institute of Tech. Nice. Which is really exciting to see, right? Yeah. Um, We've seen that there's a number of schools that we're seeing it in. One of the areas that we've seen it uh, really take some acceleration is in the area of esports and how that's a gaming environment on campus. Right. Um, And it's, quote unquote, an athletic venue. Yeah. Um, And that's really requiring that requires everybody 
to to connect to the outcome yeah and not so much to the technology or platform yeah because if it was connected to the platform we'd all be thinking about how do i bring in a a sports production truck and right. produce a sports event right 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 and twitch is not anywhere within the not even close NCAA sporting environment right 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 so that's helping helping a lot of schools move. i think the esports example is is super apropos and and right in line with uh, with i think that example of the experience um one of the things inherently if you think about the college dorm room um that is for the most part, where they're playing. That's right. And number two, they're not playing against people in the dorm. Right. They're playing with somebody on the other side of the world. That's I mean, right. these are teams that come together to solve problems. Right. There's some great research around the benefits of team problem solving. Yeah. Especially when you, you cross cultural boundaries, you might cross language boundaries. Um, such an interesting application when you think of college experience, teaming, problem solving, strategy. Right. right. It's all there. Right. Yeah. So you, you think of esports as an example, yeah. right? And you say, all right, this is there a community around esports? Yeah, the online right. viewership of esports outpaces NHL, NBA, Major yeah. League Baseball. The the combined prize or purse money um, outpaces the Kentucky Derby as yeah. an example, or the U.S. Open in golf. Yeah. So there's there's a huge constituency and a huge community of players who happened to be going to school and then we're asking them to sit yeah. in a stack of chairs facing the front of the room. Impossible. Yeah, it's just it, not, it's not gonna work. Not, not gonna work. So right? here's a here's a great example of, of this conversation. So uh, Jane McGonigal, I don't know if you've ever heard that uh-huh. name. She's a, a TEDx speaker and educator and she's passionate about gaming and the benefits of gaming in the educational environment. And her quote, or I shouldn't even say quote, her mantra is something called urgent optimism. Oh, wow. And the whole notion of urgent optimism is gamers anxiously engage in a in a losing proposition. 80% of the time they are going to die. Hmm. <laughs> Their character is going to be yeah. discontinued. Yeah. So the point is is they anxiously engage it urgently, right? And they're optimistic that eventually they win, right? And and whether or not they win. So the point the point being here is if you take wow. that whole urgent optimism approach that's to awesome. education and problem solving in the world, oh, you awesome. know that could be applied in ways that uh, you know that we, we can't even imagine. Yeah. So and it definitely ties back to that DevOps AV design environment yeah. that provides tools and platform, yep. you know, for the opportunity. Okay, Brad, we've been sitting here in uh, AVI Systems headquarters in San Diego, California. We want to thank our sponsor, Bose Professional. Yeah, indeed. And and AVI Systems today for this conversation on technology trends and happenings in the education sector. The last word to you, Brad, what advice would you give to an organization that's heading out uh, on the journey of making sure that they've got, you know, a great approach and a great um, direction as it relates to building uh, a great experience within their environment? Yeah, so I I would say that it's super easy to talk about the bits and bytes and the specs. I I would postpone that discussion until we really understand and can articulate the human impact. Yeah. Start with that first, because, you know, I'm going to say for myself, I'll confess, I've designed lots of systems that were super well engineered and never used because we didn't take into consideration what the human expectation was. So start with that first. Yep. Yep. Move into design, then into engineering, and then don't forget that it's a life cycle. Yeah. And today's AV space, it's never a one and done. It's always, always, always refreshed. And the average product life cycle in our industry is about six months. So wow. let's continue to remember that we're going to continue to optimize and develop even after it's already been implemented. The industry. outcome such a critical part. You've talked a lot about that today. Uh, how does somebody get in touch with you and your organization if they want to get more information? Well, if you haven't guessed, we're super passionate about it. We love talking about it. <laughs> Start at avisystems.com online. You can get a hold of uh, any number of good people there, including myself. You can find me on LinkedIn. Love to share that with people. And then uh, we also have offices that are near uh, most every place here in the United States. So we're happy to just have a face-to-face conversation. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. Thank you, man.